الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد uh, we are going to continue our study of the fourth ayah of Surah Al-Nas من شر الوسواس الخناس we did not get into the word analysis we ask Allah's refuge from من شر we talked about شر last time شرارة the spark that comes out of a flame that can burn you شر means evil and specifically an evil that can cause you harm a harmful evil would be the word shar. Then there's the word, very interesting word, al waswas al khannas. Now Allah did not say a shaitan. Uh, shaitan, shatana, the description of which inshallah will come in, when we get to that word in other places in the Quran, has to do with being consumed with rage. That's what the word shaitan essentially has to do with, being consumed with rage. And there's a difference of opinion among ulama about the root origin of shaitan also is that shata or shatana. There, there, there are two ways of looking at it. But in this case, al-waswas, waswasa in Arabic gets commonly translated as whisper. Uh, waswasa with the tamar buta at the end. Okay? The other word in Arabic for whisper is hamasa. Hamasa. So the first question to ask is, what's the difference between saying hamas, you know, min al-hamis, min sharri al-hamis al-khannas, and waswas. <coughs> the word hamas is to whisper something whether it be good or bad. Waswas is only used in a negative context. That's the first difference. The second difference is the qarar al If there's a if if there's a, uh, a repetition of syllables of a word inside a word, it actually uh, rhetorically alludes to the repetition of the act itself. Ham is someone who whispers. Muwaswis, someone who whispers and then whispers again and then whispers again and then whispers again. Was wasa was wasa. Similar words, for example, zal zala. The earth shakes, then it shakes again, then it shakes again. Zalzala. Okay. A series of mountains, one after the other. Silsila. Two syllables that are similar to describe continuity, to describe repetition. So the first part of the root origin, just the root letters of the word waswas, tells us that the act of whispering is taking place, first of all, for evil intent, and second of all, repeatedly. But then the one who whispers, and this is the English translation, right? It says, from the evil of the whisperer. The Arabic word whisperer would have been al muwaswis That's ism fa'il, the active participle, and the translation would be whisperer. But Allah did not use the word muwaswis. And the, the infinitive form, to whisper, or whispering, is waswasa with the tamarbuta, or wiswas. When I say wiswas, what haraka did I put on the wow? A kasra, right? Wiswas, that's to whisper. So we're not even asking refuge from the whisper itself. But when you say waswas with al-fatha, this is called sigatul mubalagha. Meaning the one who whispers a lot, the extreme whisperer, who is obsessed with whispering. If he was just a whisperer, he would have been muwaswis. Muwaswis. But he is obsessive compulsive whisperer, he is waswas. He doesn't stop. He keeps going and going and going. Now the word itself had repetition because of its root. And now add to it further hyperbole, further strength because of the pattern from the self. So from the origin, the jither point of view, it's powerful and rep repetitious. And on top of that, there's the sarf, the way it's spelled in the Arabic language in the Quran. And this is a very, very powerful word to use to describe the action of Iblis. Now specifically, there's pretty much ijma' that this is referring to Iblis. Specifically Iblis. Why specifically Iblis? First and foremost, because it's al-waswas. You remember at the end of Surah Al-Falaq, we said, وَمِن شَرِّ Hasidin. We didn't say Al-Hasid. If you say Al-Hasid, it's Iblis. Who Al-Hasid? But here is Al-Waswas. So it's referring specifically first and foremost to Iblis. Now if it was just anyone who whispers, it would have been Min Sharri Waswasin Khannasin. That could be anybody. But this is very, very particularly a reference to Iblis. This comes to, this, this solves a philosophical problem that some people have. Again, because of the scientific rationalism and other philosophical ideas that have entered into people's minds. It was even offered by some contemporary writers on the Quran that the Iblis of that time, that guy died. All we have now are his followers. And his mission is continuing. When he asked Allah, Anlidni ila yawmi yub'athun, give me time until the day they are raised. Allah gave him time not for him, but for his mission. So he himself is dead. We don't accept this idea in the vast majority of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and there's no basis for it anyway. And if there was any basis for it, then there's no reason he should be alive at the time of the Prophet himself. So, how come the ayah says, Afatatakhiduna hu wa dhurriyatahu awliya amin duni? 
the, the ayah says, do you take him and his children, his followers, as guardians and friends besides myself? So Allah mentioned his children and he mentioned himself, which means he's still around. He's, being, he's offering his friendship still. And his children. So if you say, oh, it's just his kids now or his following, the ones who take, took on his path, that's all it's referring to. There's a refutation for that in the Qur'an anyway. Plus, of course, the several narrations uh, that deal with the subject. But anyway, now we come to, again, the word al-waswas. And the, the uh, benefit of saying waswas as opposed to saying waswasa. Min sharril waswasa. The waswasa is the one that has the harm, right? The whisper itself is the one that carries the harm. So what's the benefit of saying from the evil of the whisperer as, as opposed to saying from the evil of the whispering? Of the whisper itself. What difference does it make? Let's listen. وَجَاءَتِ الْإِسْتِعَاذَةَ بِشَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ وَلَيْسَ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسَ فَقَطْ لِلْدَلَالَةِ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْإِسْتِعَاذَةَ إِنَّمَا تَكُونُ مِنْ كُلِّ شُرُورِ الْوَسْوَاسِ أو من كل شرور الموسوس سواء كانت وسوسة أو لم تكن. What it, what it means is the one who does the whispering can do more evils than just whisper. He can do more evils. And when we ask Allah's protection from the evil of the one who engages in the act of whispering, and a lot of it, we're asking protection from the whispers and from other things he may do. If you just say for Allah Azza wa to protect us from the whispering itself. If he tries to do anything else, we're not protected. But if you say, the one who's doing whisper, I want protection of evil of him. Everything he does, whisper or not, we got protection from. So it's more comprehensive to say, min sharril waswas, than just to say, min sharril waswasa. Then a sifa, an adjective has been added, al khannas. This word came before in the Quran, when we were studying, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ khunnas. Same root origin, khunnas. It was used to describe stars, that seem to the eye that they twinkle and then they disappear. It's like they take a step back. Or stars that turn around. Right? It seems in the sky like they turned around or they, they, they took a, they beat a retreat. That's the word khanasa, even in the hadith we just read. Or the, the, the athar of the sahabi. That when, you, when he remembers Allah, then the, the shaitan retreats. He takes a step back. That is khanasa. But the word isn't min sharril waswas al khanis. Khanis, the one who steps back. Khannas, the one who keeps stepping back. And if you want to keep stepping back, it means you keep stepping forward, then you keep stepping back, then you keep stepping forward, then you keep stepping back. You know what this means? That means he's constantly whispering. Where do we get that? In al-waswas. And the more you remember Allah, the more what's he doing? Taking a step back. And the moment he sees an opportunity, what does he do again? Takes a step forward. And then you push him away, he steps back again. And you would think after several times of being pushed back, he would give up. But according to the word al-khannas, sighatul mubalagha yadullu ala takrar. This khannas, like, you know, in Arabic you say khabbaz. From khubz, you know what khubz is? Bread. Khabbaz, the guy who bakes bread over and over and over again. He does it for a living. He doesn't stop. He didn't make one pita bread and he's done. <laughs> or one naan and he's finished. He's gonna make, do, he's gonna do it for a living all the time. Someone who keeps giving gifts, doesn't stop. Wahhab. He bought a gift. Wahhab, the one who keeps giving gifts. Over and over and over and over again. Allah is, one of Allah's names, Ghaffar. Ghaffar. Not just that He's forgiving, but He keeps forgiving over and over and over again. This is a repetition in the word. So we say, Khannas. He keeps coming back. He keeps coming back. Remember I was saying, saying to you before, unofficially, He doesn't quit. The word we know where He doesn't quit, but He does take a retreat is the word Khannas. So His offense is Al-Waswas, His defense is? Al Khannas. We got both sides of the picture of Iblis inside these two words. Min Sharr al Waswasi, Al Khannas. Here also we should mention something uh, the contrast. The surah began with us expressing our humility and we ask protection from the one who is the most arrogant. So our humility is being contrasted with the arrogance of Iblis. The other thing that's important to note here is remember we said the summary of Qur'an to accept yourself a slave? Now listen to this amazing ayah about protecting yourself from Iblis. Allah says, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. No doubt about it, my slaves, the ones who accept themselves as my slaves, you will have no authority over them. Your authority will die from the moment they accept my slavery. What was the first thing we said in this surah? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِي and if he's Rabb, in kana Rabban, fanahnu 
What are we then? We're ibad. We become slaves. If you truly accept Allah's slavery, that in and of itself is a protection from shaitan. To act as Allah's slave, to live as Allah's slave, is a protection of shaitan. If you notice the people nowadays, you know, the issue of possession, the issue of psychological problems, depression, this and that, this does not happen to people that truly obey Allah. You, it happens to people party all the time, they're blasting music in the car all the time, you know, they're just you know, living it up or whatever, and they don't care what they look at, they don't care how to clean themselves, you know, even though this is not, it's not like a life and death issue, but it's an important issue in the deen, to clean yourself properly, to have tahara, you know. And one of the people, you know, they don't, they don't clean themselves properly after they go to the bathroom, they have najas on their clothes, they come and make salah in the masjid. I'm not going to go as far as saying it's kufr, but you're inviting shayateen. Open invitation. Not just vacancy, free rent. Come on in, you know. And we, we have these kinds of problems in our community. You know, our, our children, we don't teach them. We don't teach them these simple things. Inshallah ta'ala, when it comes to the sihr and things like that, we'll probably have, I'll have Shaykh Abdul Nasser do a long session on precautions that we have to do. But one of the easiest precautions is not just cleansing of the heart, but even cleansing of the body. We're supposed to be in a state of wudu. There's a reason. The Messenger of Allah, وسلم, before he went to sleep, he would recite these surahs, but, and he would also be in a state of wudu. He would be in a state of wudu. So reciting these surahs was a spiritual cleansing, and the physical cleansing comes from the wudu. All against shaitan. You know, our kids, we don't think twice if they're standing up and urinating. You know, masajid, look at the bathrooms. I go across the country in masajid. I mean, the airports have cleaner bathrooms. And that's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. You know, our kids don't know. We don't tell them the importance of these things. And then when they are, you know, they're, they're obsessively, like, they're constantly, constantly angry. And as soon as there's some mention of Quran or Islam, they get irritated and they run away. That's, that's a good sign of shaitan right there. Shaitan gets irritated when Allah is remembered. He gets irritated when Allah is remembered. Not just, you know, I don't want to hear it. Ah, can we, put, can we turn it off? You ever drive with people like that? You know? They, they can't even listen to recitation of Quran. It hurts. It hurts. Subhanallah. So we have to be, you have to be really uh, cautious about this. It's a tangent. But nonetheless, inshallah, when the time comes, we will deal with it in uh, greater detail. Now the beautiful ayah, الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُوا فِي صُبُورِ النَّاسِ قَدْ ذَكَرَ الْوَسْوَاسِ he already mentioned waswas. Now he's repeating it. Alladhi yuwaswisu, the one who continually whispers and will continue to whisper. Waswas is an ism. And an ism yadullu ala dawam. It mentioned, it, it, it alludes to something that's there. That's what he is. You know when someone says, for example, I'm a teacher. You know what that means? I, that's what I do. That's who I am. He's been identified as al waswas al khannas. But then Allah says, he lives up to that title too. It's one thing to call yourself that. To earn that title, to have that title, is another to earn it by actually doing it constantly. Now the mudari' form, the present tense form, what it tells us is, not only is he known for being that, he is, he is doing it now and he will continue to do it, because the word the mudari', the present tense form in Arabic, includes the future. He is doing it and he will do it, you better be ready. You better be mentally prepared that he's never going to stop. You're never going to have. You're never have going to live a time where you don't have to ask Allah's protection from His waswasa. But then Allah added something remarkable. He said, "Fi sudurin nas, not just fin nas or lin nas or ilan nas." He whispers to the people. He whispers, you know, into the people, but in the chests of the people. The word sadr, according to Abdul Rahman Kilani in his famous Mutaradifatul Quran, he says sadr is zarf uh, makan. Sadr is a place. Qalb is a thing. Qalbu shay'un. Al qalbu shay'. It's something. But sadr is a place. Allah did not say in the ayah, He whispers and retreats and constantly does so for evil in the hearts of people. He didn't use the word hearts. What word did He use? The chests. The chests. There's a difference between saying He whispers in the hearts and He whispers in the chests. The imagery, if you want to put it in the form of an image to help you understand it, think of it like this. The heart is like a castle. And around the castle, there's some open real estate. There's a yard, there's a, there's a front yard, side yard, backyard. Open real estate. And all of this real estate and the heart is inside your chest. Allah said He gave him access to the chest, but not access to what? Not the heart. So he's in the front yard, or he's in the backyard. He's all around, but he's not where yet? He's not in the heart, the heart is locked. Door's locked. And the only one who has the keys to that door is who? You. If you open that door, he's waiting. He's constantly there. You waswisu fi sudur in nas, hoping one day he can enter the qalb. But to, if you let him in the qalb, what's going to happen then? Or if you don't let him in the qalb, you could say isti'ada and he'll stay outside. He won't disappear. He'll take a step back, maybe quiet for a few seconds. Maybe find a couple hours later, come back to you again. 
But if you let him in, what happens? Let me tell you the contrast. People who have Iman, people who have Iman, you know what's beautiful to them? Faith itself, remembering Allah itself. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah beautified Iman for you and He actually made it beloved to you and He beautified it inside your hearts. You find beauty in Iman. You find beauty in this belief. Now, imagine what happens when shaitan makes his way in. What's going to happen? Are you going to find beauty in Iman anymore? No. You'll find beauty in something else. So Allah says, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ when shaitan makes his way into your heart, evil deeds start looking beautiful. They start looking tempting. They start looking good. If the remembrance of Allah is in your heart, evil deeds will look ugly. They will وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرُ وَالْفُسُوقُ وَالْعِسْيَانِ Allah made disbelief and corruption and disobedience disgusting to you. If you have iman in your heart, those things look disgusting. You're not even tempted. You could drive by a club and say, Astaghfirullah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. What a, face to, what, a, what a waste of humanity. What a disgrace to the, the son of Adam. And he was honored with such intellect and what worse life than animals they live. You would spit at it. But if shaitan made his way, his way in, you're like, hey, well, I'll just pull over for a little while. Now it's starting to look beautiful. This is the difference between the one who's let him in and the one who hasn't let him in. Where do we stand? When we see something evil, are we tempted by it? Are we disgusted by it? Tells us how much we're remembering Allah, what the state of Iman is. If Iman is beautified, disbelief, kufr, corruption will look evil. And if shaitan has finally found an entrance, then the other way around. So Allah gave is a mercy of Allah. He gave him access to the chest, but not access to the heart. That is our responsibility. That is our responsibility. May Allah give us the ability to protect our hearts. Min al jinnati wa nas, the last ayah. It seems like it's a very simple ayah, but there's actually quite a few complications that are talked about in this ayah. First of all, there's the minor issue of taqdeem and ta'khir. Allah mentioned jinn first and nas second. In another place in the Quran, when it came to shayateen, he, he mentioned human beings first and jinn second. Allah Azza wa says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنْ So in the other place, when shayateen were mentioned, human shayateen, human devils were mentioned first, and jinn, Devils were mentioned second. But in this case, Jinnah first and Nas second. The context of the ayah, the, the previous ayah where human beings are mentioned first, is talking about enemies of prophets. And the animosity against the prophets from the get-go is engaged in by human beings first. They are the ones who outright go out against the Messenger of Allah. But when it comes generally speaking, because the context of this surah is not animosity against prophets, it's the waswasa, whisper. Who is better at whisper, the human being or the jinn? Who takes the primary role? The jinn. Also, the waswasa of the jinn, who al asl, as the ulama comment. Who al it is the, it is original. In other words, if a human being is whispering something evil to you, it may or may not be his original idea. He may self have plagiarized it from a shaitan, <laughs> from a jinn to begin with. But when a jinn does waswasa, it is his own. It's his original. So the source is mentioned first, min al jinnah, and then the secondary, wan nas. And here we learn something else, vehicles. Shaitan uses vehicles. This bin al-jinnah can be istikhdaman also. What that means is shayati, Iblis uses jinns and uses people to conduct his waswasa. He uses them to conduct his waswasa. So you know that waswasa of shaitan can come to you through your best friend. You hear his voice on the phone. You don't hear Iblis' voice, but you know what? He's, at that point he's a puppet for Iblis. And he especially does this with kuffar, not as much as Muslims, but especially with kuffar. Young man is going to college, trying to guard his, his, his shame. He's a good looking guy, you know, he decides, man, these girls give me too much attention. I gotta grow a beard, because you grow a beard, automatic girl deterrent, right? So he grows a beard, to, and by the way, I know I'm not gonna pass a fatwa on beard, but I tell the younger guys here, if you're going to college, grow a beard, it'll save you from a lot of trouble. You're just going to look in the mirror and say, I'm going to go to a party looking like that. I look like I'm trying to imitate Allah's messenger, then I'm going to go to the party. You'll be ashamed of yourself. You won't be able to go. So protect yourself, grow a beard. It's a, I'm not giving you a fatwa. This is a psychological deterrent. You know? So anyways, this guy is growing a beard. He's trying to protect himself. He's, he keeps his eyes low. Shaitan doesn't come to him. You know what he does? He goes to this non-Muslim girl and says, hey, go talk to him. So she comes over. Did you do the assignment from last week? Innocent question. Because I think you're really smart. Uh-oh, now it's starting to get a little dangerous. He'll come to him. For, and now if he starts giving it some thought, 
Then he opened the door, now he comes to him. You see that? He'll come, he'll use people like puppets to give waswasa to you. He'll use people like puppets. And now he doesn't even have to use people. Now he's got websites and TV channels that do it for him. He's got his work on DVD. You know? It just doesn't, it automated. He's, you know, he, he could kick back and relax and watch, even though he doesn't ever kick back, like we said. But we facilitated his job for him through modern, you know, mass media. Mass media can be used for great things, but for the most part, it's being used for evil things. You know, for evil things. So this is, you know, min sharril waswasil khannat, min al jinnati wan nas rather. They could be from the jinn, and they could also be from the people. But the source is al waswas, and then these guys, these are being used. So they're in a secondary position. The, the complication is that the word nas. To, to help you with this next complication, this is a minority opinion, nonetheless a legitimate scholarly opinion, because it comes from Al Farra, Rahimahullah. It's a very powerful, because he's one of the great Arab linguists. In the Quran, Allah uses the word nafar. Nafar is usually used for a group of people. He uses the word nafar and says a group of people from among the jinn. Nafar typically in literature is not used for jinn, it's used for who? Human beings. But in the ayah now it was used for jinn. Another word, the word rijal. The word rijal is used men, obviously people or jinn. It's people. But we find in the Quran, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ يَعُوذُونَ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ There used to be men from among the human beings who sought refuge with men from among the jinn. So now rijal is being used for human beings and also for jinn. But the string is just is actually a hadith or an other narration reported by Baghawi, where they, the Sahaba report meeting a group of people that were very strange looking. So they said, Manil qawm, who are you guys? What, what nation you come from? So they said, Unasum min al jinn. Really interesting language. They said, We are people from the jinn. But what word did they use for themselves? The plural of nas, unas. Unas min al jinn. Now, to help you understand this in English, a group of scholars in minority say that the, f the last phrase, min al jinnati wan nas, is actually an explanation of the word nas in the previous ayah. Alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al nas, that last word nas, those nas can be from the people or from the jinn. Now, this sounds confusing. Those who whisper in the hearts of people, the hearts of people, those people may be from human beings and the people may be from the jinn. The traditional explanation, the majority explanation is the one who whispers can be from the jinn and the one who whispers can also be from the human beings. But they're saying, no, in addition, this could also mean the one who is whispered to, the one whose chest is entered can be a jinn and the one whose chest is entered can also be a human being because they're saying the word nas can be used to refer comprehensively to a jinn also. So this, uh, this ayah is a protection not only for believing human beings, but it's also protection for believers from among the jinn. That's what, what the suggestion It's a minority opinion, but nonetheless, it has come up in conversation among several scholars. Zamakhshari commented and added something interesting to this discussion. He said, that last word, nas, alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas, is missing a ya at the end. You know, the, the Quran says, yawma yad'u da'i ila shay'in nukur. Da'i with a kasra. But the actual word is da'i with a ya at the end. It gets omitted. So he's saying, الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ The one who whispers in the chest of the forgetful one. If you add a ya, the meaning becomes the forgetful one. And in Arabic morphology, you can omit the ya. So he's saying that last time the word nas, the second last time nas was used, it's referring to one who is forgetful, and the forgetful one can be from the human beings, and the forgetful one can also be from the jinn. So that's the minority uh, position that is uh, talked about in regards to this ayah. Now we finally come to the conclusion of this surah. This surah is connected to two things, two surahs. On the one hand, it's connected deeply with Surah Al-Falaq, we talked about that in the beginning. But it's also deeply connected with Surah Al-Fatiha. Deeply connected with the Fatiha, it's actually the first thing that connects them is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever he would recite Surah Al-Nas, like finish Quran, what would he do immediately? Recite Al-Fatiha. Now, the, the, one of the wisdoms of that practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that it teaches us there is no end to studying Quran. You, you, you don't say, I finished the book. No, you just got started again. Right? It just, it's continual. There's no end. That's one. 
Then we learn some other thematic. As far as the themes of the two surahs, there are powerful connections between them. In Fatiha, we ask for help. Isti'ana. Iyaka nasta'in. We ask for help. This is a surah of isti'adha. One letter difference. Isti'ana, isti'adha. There we ask for help. Here we ask for protection. You ever heard of positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement? There we ask for help for accomplishing a task. Here we're asking for protection from people who are trying to keep us from accomplishing that task. So we're asking for defense here and offense there, you could say in simple terms. Right? Isti'ana, isti'adha. That's one thing that connects them. Then of course the three names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are mentioned in this surah. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ what? رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ What do you find in Fatiha? مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ you say, Ilahin nas, the one who is to be worshipped and obeyed. What do we say in Fatiha? Iyaka na'budu. So there's correlation between what Allah says about Himself in the Fatiha and what He says about Himself in Surah An-Nas. Some have even gone deeper in their literary analysis and said, you know how Allah mentioned Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim in Fatiha? Dhakar Ar-Rahma, He mentioned His mercy. But He did not mention mercy in, uh, in Surah uh, Surat An-Nas. It is because Surah Al-Fatiha begins with a positive word. So the theme overall is more positive. But uh, Surah Al-Nas begins with something negative. Qul a'udhu, seeking refuge, seeking protection, obviously from something negative. So less positive words are used. Subhanallah. So there's even parallel, you know, like, as they say in Arabic. For every word, there's a proper context. Then going further, there's reciprocity. Remember, you know, sometimes what Allah does is He'll begin with a subject, subject A, and go into subject B. And to finish it off in another place, He'll start with B and end with A. Which is kind of like what happens here. This surah, this surah began with asking for help, asking for protection. And Fatiha ends with asking for help. The conclusion of Fatiha is Aydina Salat al Mustaqim, and the rest of it is really one large sentence. So here we begin with asking, there we end with asking. So there's this reciprocal relationship. Another remarkable thing is the parallel between the singular and the plural. A'udhu, the verb used for us in this surah is singular. A'udhu. But the verb used for us in the Fatiha was plural. We say iyaka, not a'budu, but na'budu. So there's this balance between singular and plural also. And there's a reason for it. The things we ask for in the Fatiha are really collective. Guide us to the straight path. We as a whole, as an ummah, need help. And we don't want to fall into the tracks of the other ummah, al maghdub alayhim and so the entire discussion was in collective terms. But when it comes to the waswas of shaitan, is that a collective thing or individual thing? That's individual. So here the surah is individual and the theme is individual. There the theme was collective and the verb usage was also collective, subhanAllah. Then the other remarkable thing is there are two possible sources of evil influence in Surah An-Nas. I know the waswas is one, but the sources are two. Or the, the way it gets to you is two. Am min al jinna aw? Minannas. It could come to you from jinn or it could come to you from human beings. So two negative influences, if you will. And in Fatiha, Allah also mentioned, watch out for two negative influences. al maghdubi alayhim and al Two negative influences here. Two, in, you could, in, if you want to put it more comprehensively, two individual negative influences here and two collective negative influences there. National negative influences are al maghdubi alayhim and al but individual negative influences are al waswas al khannas min al jinna wal nas. Those are the individualized negative influences. Then, even from a structural point of view, there is coherence in them. Fatiha is divided into two halves, two very clear halves. You know what the two halves are? You know when we get to the middle ayah of Fatiha, iya ka na'budu wa iya ka nasta'in. That ayah, the first part of that ayah is iya ka na'budu. Everything that came before iya ka na'budu is related to iya ka na'budu. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm din If you study those things, the only conclusion left is Iyaka Na'budu. If you study the rest of the Fatiha, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem, Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim, Ghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim wal al All of that is tafsir of one phrase, Iyaka Nasta'een. We ask Allah for help. What help? Guidance, to keep us away from this path, keep away from that path, put us on the straight path, etc., etc. So half of it is for Iyaka Na'budu and the other half is for two equal halves. Surah Al-Nas has its own unique halves. One half, Al-Musta'ad bihi. The other half, Al-Musta'ad minhu. Three ayat are about the one you're seeking protection of. Three ayat are the one you're seeking protection from. Qul a'udhu bi Rabbin nas, Malikin nas, Ilahin nas. Three. 
And then who are you seeking protection from? الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ Actually, min sharri al waswas al khannas. Alladhi yu waswi sufi sudur in nas. Min al jannati wa nas. Three and three. So they're both divided into two very distinguishable halves, subhanallah. But the most important part, which I'm going to conclude with, it'll take me ten minutes or less, inshaAllah, is this. Allah told us to seek refuge whenever we recite Quran. The Quran also ends with the, the telling the human being to seek refuge. And primarily from who the ultimate enemy, the, the most jealous of us, a shaitan. And the reason we are on the earth to begin with originates from a waswasa of shaitan. Adam alayhi salam. The waswasa of shaitan got us here to begin with. And the entire struggle against human beings and the shayateen, that struggle that exists to this day, the battle between kufr and Islam that exists to this day, starts with a waswasa of shaitan. It starts with the waswasa he gave Adam alayhi salam. That's where this, this conflict, this war began. Now, we learn some things about this waswasa. I'm going to share with you a passage. By the way, the story of Adam alayhi salam is so important, it's mentioned in the Quran seven different places. Seven different places. You'll find it in Baqarah, you'll find it in Araf, right? you'll find it in Hijr, you'll find it in Isra and Kahf, you'll find it in uh, Taha and Saad also. Over and over again, mention of the, the same story over and over again. There's a reason, there's a very important reason. Especially the dialogue of Iblis. But one of those dialogues I want your attention on, inshallah, because it ties everything together. It ties Fatiha and Nas together. Thus it ties the whole Quran together. Now listen carefully. He said, give me time until they are raised. He said, you, have been given, you are from those who have been given time to wait. Meaning you've been given a deadline, you can do what you need to do. He said, because of, what you, because of the way you got me expelled, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will sit for them waiting where? On your straight path. Which surah mentions the straight path? Fatiha. We're asking Allah to protect us from Iblis because he is on a mission to get us off the path mentioned in Fatiha. Fatiha is the straight path and he hates the straight path, he wants us off of it. Then in the same passage, وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ Aktharahum rather, shakirin. You will not find most of them grateful. Where did Fatiha begin? He Iblis said you won't find them being grateful. And Allah, the first thing He teaches us in Quran is what? Alhamdulillah, to be grateful. Hamd includes shukr and thana. And He says you won't find most of them truly grateful. Then in the same passage, فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَا Waswasa. Same word again. This same passage in Araf. He was the one who made waswasa to Adam Ali and to both of, the, to both of our parents. And then the, the journey begins, the problem begins. But I wanted your attention on when we ask Allah's protection from the waswasa of shaitan, is there some of all of his different whispers, is there one in particular that stands out that we should be most afraid of, most careful of? I argue this because we are living in times where we are least careful of this one. What is it? Listen. فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَا الشَّيْطَانِ لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِن سَوْآتِهِمَا he whispered to both of them, both of who? Our parents, alayhim salam So he may expose to them that which was covered from their clothes. He whispered to both of them, leading to that which is shameless. To this day, what is the great waswas of shaitan? To create fahsha in society. Innama ya'murukum bisu'i wal fahsha. You know when you say su, evil, Fahsha is included. When you say, Allah says, shaitan will command you to evil. Evil includes shamelessness. But Allah said, no, you have to be so careful, I will mention it separately. Evil, especially shamelessness. إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّوءِ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ This is where shaitan will get you. This is where shaitan will get you. It's just a text message. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, you know. I'm just calling. Yeah, I'm just going to lunch. It's not like I'm committing zina. It's just lunch. It's just lunch now. Shaitan's got his whole project map laid out for you. And this is just one part of the project. And they're giving each other high fives because you're just going to lunch. Or we're just talking. Or I'm concerned for, I'm giving da'wah. That's a good one I've heard recently. I'm giving da'wah to her. That's a pretty good one, right? Shaitan will come to you, those of you that are married. Your wife will start looking ugly and the secretary at work will start looking beautiful. He'll get you. 
You know, you come home, wife will say, how was your day? I don't want to talk about it. You go to the office, the secretary says, how was your day? Let me tell you. You know, you give her an essay answer. What is this? This is fashia. It's subtle. It's subconscious sometimes even. But he'll get you. If you're not watching carefully, if you're not listening carefully to this waswasa, and you're not you know, asking Allah to protect you, He will get you like that. And of all of the fears that Allah's Messenger had against us, that the fears that He, would, he, would have, he was afraid for this ummah, things will happen. He was not afraid of rulers coming over us, armies attacking us, people slaughtering us. What, was the, what, did, he, what did He fear? Al-Fahsha. He feared shamelessness. He feared shamelessness. And my, 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 the, the bigger problem to me is not even our shamelessness. It's the, it's the lack of shame we're giving our children. They're watching like Disney garbage and like, you know, uh, what, what used to be PG, you know, what used to be PG-13 is now PG. You know, the ratings are going down. It's becoming more and more shameless. And our kids are just watching it. Girls wa- walking into Islamic school with Miley Cyrus book bags, you know. For God's sake. Seriously, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim He's got us, he got us, you know, really good. And if you tell someone, really, brother, I, th- I don't think we should be mixing like this. I don't think this is how you do a wedding. I think we should separate the two genders. Because really, we're inviting shaitan as also an uninvited guest. Might as well print a business, print an invitation card for him too, if you're going to do it like that. And people say, don't be crazy, you're being extreme. You're being extreme. And then they'll also, they'll, you know what else they'll say? They'll say, listen. Are you saying that just because I'm you know, talking to a sister that necessarily shaitan is going to come and get me? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, no, I'm not that desperate. The guy will say, I'm not that desperate. Listen, I'm a guy too. We know what goes on in our head. We know how shaitan comes and attacks. He never stops. He never stops. Ever. So if you're going to come and tell me, no, it doesn't affect me, you are lying to me and yourself. You're not just lying to me. He will get us with this attack. The final thing I want to share with you about this beautiful surah is the Qur'an begins with dua. Ihdina sirat. This first surah began with dua. The Qur'an ends with dua. A'udhu bi rabbinnah. It's also asking Allah to enter ourselves into His protection. The beginning and ending is dua. The beginning of Qur'an, you seek Allah's protection from shaitan. فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ And at the end, you seek Allah's protection. That path that we need to walk on, on the, you know, the straight path that Allah has gifted us with, the greatest enemy to that path is Iblis himself, and he will try to get us off of it any way he can. If he can't get you intellectually, he will get you psychologically. If not psychologically, he'll get you emotionally. He'll get you like spiritually. He'll get you some way. He'll find some way. He's, all, he's always doing research. He's doing a PhD paper just on you and what you mess up with. And he knows what you're, every time you make a mistake, he knows what you tend to usually fall into sin. And he'll make sure he, you fall into those traps over and over again. The Quran begins and ends with dua. Don't underestimate the power of dua. In conclusion, I want the, the surah, the dars of the surah is done, walhamdulillah. And so is the study of juz amma. And at this point, I just wanted to share with you some thoughts, inshallah ta'ala, and I'm, and I'm done. And that is this, this series began about a little over a year ago in Maryland. I decided to do a detailed study of Juz Amma for myself and just share what I'm studying with folks on a weekly basis. And we you know, started recording these, we started putting podcasts online. A lot of people are actually listening, that are gonna be listening to this in the future, the recording itself. Um, I didn't realize what an impact this had. I, I really didn't realize. There are over 2,000, well over 2,000 subscribers on iTunes and I, I'm, I just came from Albany, I met four or five brothers that are in a study circle. They're like transcribing the whole lecture series. I met a group of sisters in California. There's a bunch of, there's a sister in Bangladesh who's translating the whole thing into Bangla or something. It was ridiculous. I, I didn't realize how much benefit this would have. But at the same time, that scares me. So uh, what I want to share with you is the following. The intention, inshallah ta'ala, between myself and my colleague, Sheikh Abdul Nasir, is to finish a study like this one of the entire Qur'an and make it available in the form of an audio library for people to benefit from. Of course, we're human beings and mistakes will be made. And I don't, I don't consider myself beyond that. Um, and I really do think already in what I've covered, subhanAllah, if I go back to it, probably I will find things that I could have said better or I would want to take out or I want to edit and I will start that process myself as well. But then, what is it that compels me to do this to begin with? To me personally, my own conviction is that the moral, spiritual, 
intellectual and psychological decline of the Muslims is because of a lack of connection with the Qur'an. We're not connected to the Qur'an. We're supposed to be connected with the Qur'an in our salah. We're supposed to be connected with the Qur'an in our salah. It's, every time you make salah, you should be refreshed morally, spiritually, intellectually, psychologically. You're supposed to be revived. Even your conviction should be revived, that this is Allah's word. And this is what He wants me to do. But we're disconnected from the Qur'an. Now, also I realize we, more and more we have become a people not of reading, but of listening. And in recent times, if you look at the last 50, 60 years, the Muslims, even religious Muslims that studied the Qur'an, the, at, at, you know, there's tulaba al-ilm, there's the students of knowledge, they study the books, but the vast majority of people, you know what they do? They listen to dars, they listen to a halaqa, they li they, people listen to the, for example, the lectures of uh, uh, Shaykh Mutawalli al-Sha'arawi rahimahullah, or Ibn Uthaymiyyin rahimahullah, right? People listen to the, the, the tafsir of Shaykh Kishk in the Arab world, rahimahullah, Dr. Israr Ahmed, you know, Mufti Muhammad Shafi used to be on the radio in Pakistan, people used to listen to his tafsir. Far more people are listening than are reading. Of course, this is the work of Dr. Farad Hashmi, may Allah reward her and protect her, you know, and her students. Word by word analysis of Quran is not a joke, it's a lot of work, you know. But you know what? In the English language, thus far, if somebody takes Shahada today and says, I want to learn about the Quran in depth. Now, if they were Arab, they could just pop in a little Mutawalli Sha'arawi. They could listen to, they're driving to work and they're listening to Dars of Quran, right? They're, they're, they're traveling and they're listening. They're sitting at home, mom's cooking at home and she's listening to a tafsir. It's possible in Urdu, it's possible in Arabic, probably in other languages too. But which language is it not possible in right now? Not comprehensively anyway. Not in English. And I feel the most need is in English. The most need is in English, to have a comprehensive study of the Qur'an. And inshallah ta'ala, if and I'm nowhere near a scholar, so I'm hoping that a real scholar listens to some of this and says, what is this joker doing? Let me tell him how it's really done. And they actually do a right series. But until that happens, I feel compelled. Until that happens, something has to be done at least. Something needs to be out there. And inshallah ta'ala, we, we, we better and better ourselves and we get more people involved. At this point, I'm very grateful that I've got Sheikh Abdul Nasser involved in between. My original pen was my own project for seven years, but since we're splitting the mushaf between myself and he, it's going to inshallah be half that time, if not a little over, but at least half the time, uh, inshallah ta'ala. He, by the way, I'm going to take a month off. I need to take a, take a break. Uh, but mostly because I'm, I'll be studying another surah separate from this series. I'll be studying it, uh, Surah Rahman extensively because of a series I'm starting, inshallah ta'ala. But in the meantime, those of you that are watching and those of you that are listening and downloading and those of you that are attending live, Shaykh Abdul Nasir will be continuing this series from just the Barak. And he's already started actually last week. He does it in Kaliville Masjid and the recordings will also be posted on our site, inshallah ta'ala, in the podcast section. So you can get, the, get a hand of those eventually when we're both done with the entire mushaf we'll take each other's load so whatever he covered already I'll cover it over again and whatever I covered he'll cover over again so at least there'll be two libraries by that time but until then just what I'm asking sincerely of you is to make dua for this project um, you know I, I, I really think it has in it material to serve as quality education for even Islamic schools you can derive from it curriculum for you know halaqat, youth halaqat and things like that. If uh, you know even like somebody wants to prepare for a khutbah at an emissary or something, you can take some of these those, take something not the whole thing but take some things out and be able to use it as an effective khutbah. But most importantly, those of you that are listening and watching, the most important thing you can do for yourself is the following: study it, memorize that surah, memorize the surah you're studying, and then recite that surah in salah. That's the most important, the best thing you can do for yourself. Because automatic khushu'ah. Even if you don't know Arabic, now you spend three, four hours studying that surah, you'll remember something about it. When you're standing in front of Allah in salah, at least something will click. Something will go on. Something better than what's for dinner tonight. You know? Or when is the imam going to ruku'ah anyway? Something better than that will go on in your head, inshallah. So the, the, get benefit of the lectures, but don't become passive about it. Re learn tajweed, learn to recite properly, memorize also, and then try to understand the, Allah's book. And inshallah ta'ala, the door to obedience and actually implementing what we learn uh, becomes easy for all of us. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, forgives the shortcomings I've had in this series and removes anything that I may have said that's not good and true from your hearts. And I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if anyone benefits even a minute of these talks that I get the commission, inshallah ta'ala, and so do my teachers and my family, and you know, uh, then all of us, may Allah include all of us from the best of the Muslims 
who he said, who the Messenger promised, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you are the ones who learn the Qur'an and teach it. So if we're not, either we're learning or we're teaching, but we should be doing one of those two things. So we can be from the best of the Muslims. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless this gathering and uh, protect the work of this deen, especially protect our scholars. And may Allah help us understand love and properly implement the book of Allah and love and, and follow the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam barakallahu li wa lakum fil qur'an al hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al hakim wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh